Hello, this is Professor Congleton again, and uh, today we're going to finish up the block on pure public goods, uh, and we're going to talk about one more solution. Okay, last time we went through the same Wilsonian solution. Today we're going to go through something called the Lindahl solution. Uh, Lindahl was a Swedish economist writing uh, 15, 20 years uh, or so uh, before Samuelson turned his pen to think about public goods problems. And uh, Lindahl was influenced by his professor, a guy named Dixell, uh, to uh, think in terms of solutions that would uh, tend to generate consensus uh, at the level of a legislature at least, so that policies uh, could be uh, plausibly adopted uh, that would tend to benefit uh, uh, close to everyone. Right. So, uh, in, 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 in the limit, would actually benefit everyone. So, Lindahl uh, did not really necessarily press for uh, you know, ideas that would uh, produce unanimity, but occasionally they came up with ideas uh, that were um, that, that tended to go in that direction. Uh, and so, the Lindahl solution for a pure public goods problem. Uh, is kind of neat in that sense. That is, it turns out that if you could um, solve this problem in the Lindahl manner, uh, that it would be uh, politically feasible uh, uh, to get it and adopt it, okay, at least in principle. And we'll, I'll show you why, and then I'll talk a little bit about the limits to that claim. Okay, so the Lindahl solution is pretty similar to the Samuelsonian solution. Uh, it's got one more condition, right? So again, we're going to find Q star star. Again, we're going to produce at least costs. Um, and we're going to divide up costs so that uh, the sum of CI, you know, individual cost payments, equals the cost of Q star. Uh, the sum of the marginal cost, I's, equals the marginal cost of production. Um, and also such that MCI equals marginal benefit I at Q star star. Right, so we have a, a new condition. Uh, namely that at the margin, each person should, should pay according to the marginal benefits that they receive uh, from the service. Right? So this is a specific uh, uh, constraint. Now, uh, this condition only has to hold at uh, Q double star. It doesn't have to hold across the entire range. Um, uh, and so you could have taxes in principle that do different things behind Q star you know, before you get to Q star. Um, um, but the way I normally uh, assume that the uh, diagram goes or that the math would go uh, is that the, uh, uh, you know, especially when you're dealing with a marginal cost curve that's flat, is that those, those uh, marginal cost shares would be flat as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, there, so there is some wiggle room in this, uh, but it really nails down the tax system a lot more than the same Wilsonian conditions did. Uh, and it turns out that we, if you look at the, the, uh, the result, uh, that uh, this is a type of, uh, of tax system, cost-sharing system, uh, that tends to generate unanim uh, unanimous agreement. Okay. Uh, but of course, they have to accept this uh, tax rule for that to be true. So let's, let's go through the exercise. So the first step, you find Q double star. You find uh, Q double star by adding up the social marginal, uh, the, the margin, individual marginal benefit curves to uh, the, determine the social marginal benefit curve. Uh, and now I'm doing, since I'm doing roughly the same geometry each time, I'm going to get roughly the same curve, except for the way my eye tracks down to that point of my finger there off the screen. So we find the, the 
uh, quantity where social net benefits are maximized, uh, or where um, if you want uh, consumer surpluses maximized, if they're, you know, we're just thinking about voters. Uh, and we uh, then divide up the costs uh, so that each person pays a cost share that's uh, equal to their marginal benefit at Q star star, right? So right there, right there, and right there. So we're going to have three different marginal cost curves uh, in this diagram, uh, one for each individual. Uh, and the other diagram uh, with the Samuel Summon solution, uh, more complicated uh, cost share arrangements were possible. But I did the, the, the equal share one uh, just to illustrate uh, one example. So the Lindahl tax turns out to be another special case of the same Wilsonian tax uh, because it meets these uh, uh, other criteria uh, plus another one, right? So this is a special case of the Samuelson uh, solution. Uh, and I suppose Samuelson would say, well, I've got this one included too. Uh, but it just turns out that if you want to think about political feasibility and consensus and things of that sort, uh, this is the solution that's most interesting. So let's draw that in and show what it looks like. That would be the marginal cost for Kathy. That would be the marginal cost for Bob. And that would be the marginal cost for Al. So notice that if you can get a tax system in place that has this property, uh, that uh, each person prefers Q double star uh, to be the output. Right? So if they accept the tax system, they accept this division, it turns out there's no conflict over the uh, magnitude of the public service. Public service is one that everyone would agree to as being Q double star. Um, notice that uh, if we keep the assumption that people are basically the same but have, uh, but have different marginal benefit curves because they have different income levels, notice that this tax is uh, also progressive in a sense. Right? This tax is, uh, imply, uh, this division implies a higher cost share for higher income uh, uh, folks than for lower income folks. Um, now, whether it meets the technical definition of progressivity or not uh, would depend on some other things that we can tease out of the diagram. We need some math uh, to, to, to know exactly what was going on in the diagram, uh, you know, or analytics. Uh, you know, so this is just giving you um, um, the intuition that the you know, richer guy would pay a lot more than the poor guy for it. Okay, and the technical definition of progressivity is average tax rates that rise with income. Um, that might or might not be true for this particular uh, diagram because it would depend on how much income each of these guys had um, uh, exactly in order to figure out what that slope of the average to uh, average cost for uh, average tax con pardon me, the average uh, tax rate is for for, for these, these individuals. Uh, but nonetheless, you can see that if you're interested in consensus, if you think a good policy is one that uh, commands just really, really broad support, uh, then the Lindahl tax is what you, uh, what you would kind of want to look for. Uh, now, some people call this a benefit tax, the Lindahl system being a benefit tax because you're taxed according to your benefits. Uh, and that's not an unreasonable way to think of it. Um, uh, and anytime you look at a tax uh, that uh, seems correlated with benefits, you can say, well, that tax could have properties like a Lindahl tax. It could be a fairly high degree of consensus behind it. Um, the closest thing I know of to a Lindahl tax in the U.S. Uh, is the gasoline tax. And the gasoline tax is earmarked, or at least it used to be earmarked, not, not as fully earmarked as, uh, for this purpose as it used to be. But the gasoline tax used to go entirely to uh, maintaining uh, highways uh, and uh, paying for new highways. And of course, the people who get benefits from highways are people who drive a lot. The more you drive, uh, the more you pay in the gas tax. So there's some reasonably high correlation 
not perfect anymore, especially now that there are hybrids and electric cars who, who don't pay gasoline taxes. Uh, but uh, prior to that, there was a pretty high correlation between uh, the benefits that you get from the highway system and the amount that you would pay in uh, taxes. Uh, and, and that was because the, the fees were set up uh, based on usage. So user fees uh, capture some of this, and there are many uh, public services that are excludable, and so you can collect user fees um, um, uh, from the people who are actually taking advantage of that particular service. So national parks might be an example. I don't think you could say that uh, you know, the users fully pay for the national parks uh, because the value of the real estate and natural resources locked up inside those parks is, um, uh, is quite large. Uh, but they, they, they do pay for the, uh, for, uh, the bulk of the uh, park services that they experience. Uh, and, and so uh, holding the, given the land holdings that are already there, uh, you could argue that they're paying for the marginal costs of the services that, that they get uh, from the park service. Uh, well, I'm not entirely sure there is a park subsidy. You know, there, there's a budget paid out of ordinary income, but a lot of the uh, uh, park services are, are actually funded out of user fees. So there, uh, and again, that would be an example of where probably the, you know, the marginal benefits that they receive uh, from uh, the park service uh, are roughly proportional to the number of times they go to the park and, uh, and, and enjoy whatever uh, scenery and uh, natural experiences are there. So uh, uh, one can also go through uh, public goods problems uh, using uh, some elementary game theory. Uh, I believe I've put, included some of the elementary game theory uh, uh, ways of thinking about uh, public goods problems uh, in the lecture notes, uh, the ones that are available from the class website. Uh, you should take a look at those uh, ways of characterizing the problem. Uh, and I should say that in my normal exams, if I can figure out a way to do this uh, you know, remotely or you know, uh, I nearly always put a Lindahl tax uh, problem on the, uh, uh, on the second exam. So you might want to put a star somehow on your notes next to this uh, to spend some time on the Lindahl tax. And even if I don't put uh, a diagram on the exam uh, that you uh, uh, will draw, uh, odds are there'll be a diagram on the, on the, di uh, on the exam that you'll be asked to uh, uh, interpret. Uh, and or uh, multiple choice type problems uh, that would induce you to, uh, would require you to know how to do the, the diagram in order to answer the questions properly. So anyway, th I regard this to be a neat tool. It's a neat tool in a couple of ways. It, gener it starts out with a public goods problem. It, you know, it requires you to find the you know, social net benefit maximizing level of this, of this service. Uh, and then it gets you to think about well, if governments provide this service, how should it be funded? Uh, and, and the Lindahl uh, uh, solution provides one, uh, really the, um, uh, an illustration of a class of taxes uh, that could generate a high levels of consensus in favor of particular service levels. And that makes it special. Um, so it has a lot of kind of, it shows a lot of uh, uh, ideas in one place. Uh, and, and some of them are quite relevant for the the next block of material when we start thinking about political systems and, and, and democratic selection of public policies. Uh, and so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll stop this, uh, uh, this lecture on, on the Lindahl solution, uh, and uh, uh, this will complete the block on pure public goods. Uh, and next time we'll take up uh, part three of the course uh, on the political economy of public policy. So thank you very much for attending and uh, listening in. Uh, and I'll uh, uh, see you next time.